off a nice Aston Martin. I pulled up on the lights alongside Roy Keane, of all people, and uh, I had the shades on. I think I was listening to some speed garage. My arm was out the window. Um, you know, I was having myself. Uh, and then Roy, Roy gave me that look that uh, he's given many a people in his in his time. And um, as he sped off into the distance, I was sitting in this car, looked at myself in the mirror and thought, I need to get rid of this. Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. Football is back. Aguero makes it three. Chelsea switch off at the back. Like the rest of us returning to work, the Premier League is also back. Keep up to date with the latest scores on the OTB Sports app. Live updates and analysis of this summer's Premier League action. The OTB Sports app. Live score updates straight to your phone. OTB's Mount Rushmore. 32 counties. One county representative choosing their sporting Mount Rushmore. Some decisions are easy. And I was seeing teachers who had never expressed any emotion whatsoever lose their mind when Sonny was running in that home straight, trying to yeah. catch that gold no. spot. Others are controversial. Mayo's greatest celebrity fan now helps him earn his place on Mayo's Mount Rushmore is Kevin Kilbane. Join the debate across all our social channels at Off The Ball. George O'Connor, 17 summers uh, in purple and gold. And catch the live decision-making over the next few months on OTB AM, live every weekday at 7.30 AM on OTB Sports Radio. Right, it is time for this week's edition of Keith Wood's State of the Union here on OTB. We've talked about the finances of the game and the administration of the club, the school's game and the women's game. And today, it's our opportunity to talk about the laws of the game. And I'm delighted to say our guests today are two seasoned international referees, Jerome Garcez and John Lacey. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome. Before I, I talk to either of you, Keith, maybe you should set the scene for this because I know it's something that is um, a, a huge thing that you are, are very concerned about and and fascinated by and intrigued by the direction the game is going in at the moment. Uh, I am. And look, we've been taking this opportunity in, in lockdown and with COVID to just look at different parts of the game that, that we love so much, but also that we would worry about and look for things that we might change. Um, for me, one of the big issues I see in the game is a, a level of the eroding of respect for referees. And our game is an incredibly tough game. And without that respect, uh, I think we go down a very slippy, um, a slippy path. So I just that's the, the way I want to start it, actually, is do, do you guys, do you notice that it has eroded from the start of your career to the end of the career? And what's the level of control is like? Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Keith. It's certainly... Um, Getting more, it's not an easy job to begin with, I suppose. That's the first thing to say. Um, I think social media has a huge influence on and the pressures that comes on referees now externally, onto coaches, onto the referee assessors, etc. Um, but I think overall, at the top level, I think there is a decent amount of respect there, especially at the international level. Um, I'm sure coaches and captains like to put a bit of pressure on a referee as well, and that's part and parcel of it. The way it's done, for me, the majority of the time is is fine, but the, it's it, it is pushing in a direction um, that's quite concerning, I suppose. And uh, we need to protect that value of the game. And I don't know what Jerome feels about that. Yeah, I think it's it's a tough um, it's a tough job for the referee, but uh, because it's a very difficult game to to play and. Um, but I think we have a lot of respect between the, the players and the referee. Um, on the top level, I think uh, we need to keep this, um, this uh, relationship between the player and the referee. It's really, really important for, for all the people who watch the TV and after, who go on the, on the small team on the countryside in France or in Ireland, to realize that we need to keep the respect between players and uh, and the referee and coach and referees. I think it's so important for for the young and um, for amateur uh, rugby. I, just one particular element uh, is one of my bugbears, which is around the TMO. And you, for me as a player, I would want to make certain that the referee had the final say. 
that it wasn't an argument with somebody else because there is a spirit to the laws, there is a flow to the game in a certain respect. And I still think that needs to be tidied up a little. Yeah. I think what is really important is to keep the flow of the game. Um, and we start to work in June with, with the, all the French referees, and we start to, to, to speak about how we can keep um, a very strong uh, team of three on the field to make accurate decisions without um, too many TMO calls who, keep, who, who stop the flow of the game. We need to understand the balance between uh, accuracy on the field and sometimes we need to use a TMO because it's a difficult decision that we need to work with uh, another guys. But the, the key now, I think, is to, to be strong um, like a team of three on the field with the assistant referee. Yeah, uh, we, we'd be the same, Keith. Um, I, I think maybe not, not the 2019 World Cup, but 2015. Um, there was probably the TMOs were getting involved a little too bit, but I think world rugby and the different hemispheres, there's been a real focus for us to the referee to lead the decisions on field. Of course, we can't see everything, and sometimes a TMO might bring something to our attention, but I think we've very much moved away from the TMO making the decision and the referee making the decision on field. Um, he's on the field, he has the temperature of the game, he's got the feel of the game, um, and, and, and he's the captain of that team, Keith. You know, uh, the referee, the final decision comes with him, so he needs to make that final decision, and that's certainly something uh, that's been driven by all of us across the world and maybe it's something that's not coming across in that way. Yeah, and just to, to speak about World Cup 2015 in England, uh, Johnny, if you remember, um, before the World Cup, we speak about Team 21. And um, I think we realised that um, our team is, is like uh, another team on the field. And um, we realised that we need to be very strong on the field and to, to, to keep the, the leadership of the, the decision making. So it was really, really interesting to, to work uh, like this. Um, it's very interesting. Sorry, Charlie. Sorry. It's on. very interesting to hear that, that, that whole kind of evolution from 2015 to 2019, Johnny. Was that on the back of feedback from you guys? Is, is, it a, is it a relationship where the referees can come together and say, this isn't really working for us here and you need to have that voice? I, I think... There's an over-reliance sometimes, you know, when you're down in the field yourself collectively that maybe he's seen something in a TV screen that we just can't see in the stadium. Um, and I'm, this is not a cop-out, but some stadiums you go to, the screens are not of good quality. The pixelization in some of the screens, I mean, um, is it Ellis Park, is particularly in South Africa, is very far away, Jerome, isn't it? It's very hard to <laughs> actually, when you're talking about inches you can't actually see it on the screen. So you begin to rely on somebody else. And maybe we slipped into relying a little bit too much on a TMO, but that certainly has been swung back the other way with increased quality, with uh, Hawkeye facilities and stuff that's coming up on the screen is of a higher quality. And I think the referees have reacted to that and uh, are making strong on-field decisions now. Uh, yeah, and we must understand that... Um um, I don't remember in Japan, but in England, uh, semi-final, quarter-final, or final, we speak about 40 cameras on the field. So mm -hmm. it's huge for us because um, when you are on the field alone with a two assistant referee, and to be more accurate than 40 or 45 cameras, it's very difficult. Mm. Well, you're going to make mistakes because everybody makes mistakes and the players are making mistakes all the time. Do you get a lot of grief afterwards? Do you get a lot of hassle in relation to the mistakes that happen in a game? Um, I, I would say if, if you want to trawl down through social media, you will find lots of, of, of mistakes that you made in the match. But I mean, uh, with the people that I'm dealing with at the moment and the guys that were on the international panel while I was there, a very honest bunch of guys, very self-critical. I think anyone that gets to that level of refereeing are probably very hard on themselves. Um, and that's certainly the case with a lot of Jerome's referees in France and the same with the Irish guys. They're the first people to get a copy of the video on the flight home and will analyse that game. So they know where they made mistakes um, and they act on them. You know, we have performance reviewers that analyse the games just like a coach would analyse his players. We have the same system there. Uh, and it's on an online platform that everybody can see. 
So if there's learnings for the group, be it World Cup referees or top 14 referees or pro 14 referees, uh, there's not a lot of places to hide. And I remember when I started refereeing, maybe Jerome the same in France, is that... Many years ago? A long time ago now, Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, Owen Doyle would have cleverly put me out into a, a game that wasn't televised, guys, you know? And if the mistakes weren't there. But the young guys that are coming out now, they go, just like a player jumping from All Ireland League into professional Pro 14, the jump is huge. And the game is on TV straight away. So there is no place to, to make a little mistake. A team guy will be protected by his 14 teammates. He'll put the arm around, you know, the Mick Galway putting the arm around the run O'Gara type scenario. But for a referee, his first game will be live on television somewhere. And that could be him under pressure straight away just, just by the nature of being so visible now and social media adding to every mistake as well. Um, is there any particular law that you'd like to see change that would make your job an awful lot easier? I think um, uh, we speak about new guidelines about the breakdown with um, World Rugby since um, the last few months. And I think it's really interesting to find, we need to find the balance between the attacking team and defending team. So. I think the the way that we, we we go now with the breakdown, I think it's it's a good way um, because it's a it's a way that we need to find the balance and it's a way that we need to 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 protect the players um, on the breakdown. So I think we need to continue about um, thinking about the breakdown because we need to to it's, it would be it's a difficult uh, uh, sport to understand and I think we need to to find some some clear um, a law to change to for all the people who watch the TV and to understand the, uh, to understand the law. But I think it's it's I think we, we go in the good way with uh, with the breakdown. I love the idea of um, going to a game with a hat on where nobody kind of knows you and you can watch it. And if you sit between different frat fans. They don't really care about the law changes. They're only seeing their side nearly all the time. So that's hence all the, the jeering and shouting with it. But at the breakdown, it has become far more dangerous. And it seems that the change from the lack of real rucking from back in the day has made it almost more complicated because there's hands in at different times. So it's an interpretation of when are the hands on the ball or when are they not on the ball. And that change or it's been picked up more down in New Zealand at the present moment in time. Is that enough of a change, do you think? Or do you need to do something about the handling of ball in the ruck? Well, I think the four areas, Keith, when you look at the breakdown, as opposed to one, one part of it, it's, 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 it's so much going on there between the tackler himself and trying to get tacklers to roll away as quickly as possible to make that ball freely available. You have the ball carrier who is doing all types of movement on the ground. Uh, for too long, which is moving the ruck and not giving a, an arriving player, i.e. a jackler, time to get on that ball. And then you have the arriving players, the guys that are going off feet and guys that are coming in at different entries. So you've got four massive components. Um, in world rugby terms, we, we class quick ruck ball as less than three seconds. So you've anything from 140 to 220 rucks in a game where you want to see, and that depends if that team wants to use, use quick ball. You know, the team doesn't have to do that. If their strengths are box kicking or, or picking and going, they may decide to slow it down. So it's not necessarily the fans. We, and as referees, of course, we want to see good rugby uh, in a safe way. So I agree with Jerome. I think we're going in the right way um, in terms of the breakdown to provide that uh, quicker ball. So I, I see if teams, if they choose to play quick rock ball, that that should come down to maybe two and a half seconds, which is probably what we want to see. The rockers, the rock being quicker, ball away, and it's probably safer because these rocks going on too long and guys coming in with shoulders late, entries illegal, onto knees at the side. These are the areas where I feel are dangerous and guys are getting quite serious injuries. So we're in, the, we're in only the very first phase of it. You know, there's a lot of talk going on in New Zealand at the moment, a lot of penalties 
I think we need to let it breathe and everybody work together. Jerome, I don't know, do you agree? Yeah. We're working now, the Irish refs have done a lot of work in, in downtime, to French the same, because I've been speaking to Jerome. And we're, we're waiting to go back. You know, Australia's going to start. So I think we need to wait a couple of weeks and there'll be some teething problems, not only for the referees seem to be in, in the limelight already uh, on a breakdown show in, uh, in down south already, but the players haven't adjusted quite well as well. So I think the players have a responsibility and the coaches and the referees together to make it safer for all of us. I think what, what is interesting is the timing about the new, the new guidelines. We are in June. So we, we cross the... We don't know yet, but we hope that we start the season in September. So we have three months for the referees, for the coach, and for the players to think about um, the new guidelines, the, the, the new way that we need to play rugby. And uh, we are all focused about Super Rugby now because we are we we, we watch rugby on TV. Oh, it's fine, and um, we are all focused about the game because we need to understand. Um, Uh, the way, and I think it's we have, like Johnny said, we have many many penalties um, uh, against the attacking teams. But we need to find when we find this balance. I think it will be uh, great. I think what we need we, we need a quick ball, and we need turnover um, legal turnover because we need to 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 change the ball to the attacking team to the defending team, and uh, so we need to protect the jackler. I think. Another thing I find interesting, Keith, Jared, is um, that, you know, they say is the referee different in the Northern Southern Hemisphere? It's, it's actually not. You know, the messages are the same that the New Zealand, the Australians, the South Africans are getting as we are getting in France and Ireland. Probably the style of play is probably a little bit different. And if I, I'll explain that in, you know, it's a, Super Rugby is a lot of an, an offloading game where, where all the players are quite lateral because they're all looking for an offload. Whereas in France and, and, and Pro 14, our players in Ireland are a lot more ball focused. So we're, we're kind of behind the ball. So I, I don't see side entry being a huge problem in Pro 14 because we, we try to win those collisions to retain the ball. Whether that's the style of rugby, the weather conditions that we play in at a different time of year, all of those factors contribute. But I suppose when you play a lateral type game where you're attacking the gain line with guys on either shoulders and you're trying to get offloads, The danger is, if you're the ball carrier, Keaton, I'm on your shoulder, and you get smashed in a tackle, it's very difficult for me then. The, the temptation for me to come in the side because you've been stopped dead is difficult. Whereas if I'm, if I'm linear behind you, I can just literally adjust a lot easier than come inside entry. So, so it's a style thing. So it'll be interesting to see how different teams adapt as we look forward to you know, the two Irish derbies, hopefully, government guidelines and IRFU permitting that we can play rugby on the 22nd of August. I, I, I've learned a lot already in the first 15 minutes here and I'm, I'm really interested in, in your, both your sense of like, so Jerome, you've mentioned a couple of times it's, it's a difficult sport to explain to people. Do you feel like you guys have enough opportunity to explain what's going on and what the trends are in a way that isn't always in the immediate aftermath of a controversy? Yeah, I think we, I think we need to explain it. It's always difficult to explain just after the game because we, we, in France we speak it's too hot, so we need to calm down and think about everything. But I, I think we need to explain um, because the fans, um, when you watch TV, you 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 watch a game differently than the referees or player or coach because it's a difficult sport. So we, we need to, to speak maybe more uh, about the law. And, um, but I think it's, um, it's, it's getting better now because we, we try to explain and it's fine. Yeah, I, I agree. Like from nothing, Jer, to, you know, coming on this show and maybe given an opportunity to explain certain things from what World Rugby And we're all trying to do. It's not just the rep. People sometimes, you know, players say, "What are you guys going to ref?" Well, it's actually World Rugby tell us what to to ref and the players and the coaches. We're we're just trying to be consistent in what we're delivering. I think that's the important thing, and that's what what people want to see. I think 
Also, there's a lot more professional referees. Obviously, the, the five pros in Ireland will be going into the four provinces, hopefully, because obviously the, the four provinces are not going to go straight into playing a game in the Aviva. They're going to have a couple of kind of behind closed doors, first against seconds type matches to get ready with contact. And, you know, we'll facilitate the referees there. So there's great uh, learnings going on between coaches and referees and players at a pro level. It's, it's, it's probably what you mean there is more, more educating and giving this information to the wider, the wider public is, is going to help all of us. Uh, can I just I touch? So, yeah. Yeah. Look, I think there is an awful lot more. Um, the more you talk, the better and easier it is for everybody else, you know, and we keep talking about how complicated it is. Um, I just wanted to touch on one other little point on field with the captain and that relationship with the referee and the captain. You know, sometimes you see it kind of goes on too much where the, ca the, the captain challenges every single decision. What is the balance in there? And what is the story of other guys, other players, talking to the, to the referee during the game? It was maybe much easier for me than Johnny because I'm French, so sometimes it was easy for me because the player... <laughs> he just used to put the hands up, I don't know what you're talking about, and walk away, so I was... <laughs> sorry, but... <laughs> no, I, I think we need to keep a very close relationship between the um, referee and the captain. Because um, the, the, we, sometimes we need to give some clear message to the captain, and uh, so it's important to, to have a good relationship and um, because the player must understand the referee, uh, sometimes it's difficult uh, because we need, we must make a very strong decisions on, sometimes. Uh, but I think in rugby, we, we have a good uh, relationship with the captain. Do you yeah, get frustrated I, when the captain comes up too much? Yeah, I, I think a little, a little bit, but I, I, I think... Like every relationship, there has to be a little bit of love and a little bit of respect for it to flourish. Uh, and, I, and I mean, the more you get to know guys over your career, the easier it definitely gets. And, you know, and I reflect back to a new guy coming in, having to deal with Keith Wood for the first time, you know, might be intimidating for, you know, a very experienced international. So that takes a little while, while to break through. And, you know, Noel McNamara, the Irish under-20 coach, the last couple of years, you know, brought me in uh, just to do a little bit of work with our under-20 side. Two fantastic sides the last two years. But one of the things that we forget is that these guys are coming out of schools rugby in Ireland, very talented rugby players, but have never dealt with a professional referee and have never dealt with a TMO before. So they don't know the questions to ask. So a little bit of work that I was doing with them is, you know, how to speak to a professional referee. They're just 19 years old. So that process of interacting with a, with a professional referee from France that's in the Six Nations under 20, who's already a professional referee in France and ref in front of 25,000 Racing versus Toulouse is suddenly referees Ireland under 20s against England. And he's never dealt with a professional referee before. So that process starts younger now and hopefully that will help him in his dialogue going forward as a, an international captain, as we hope a lot of these under-20 players will go on, especially with the success of the two last two seasons. It, it's a skill that they need to work on, and you as referees are kind of free to help them evolve and develop. And I, I, it sounds like that's um, a proper pyramid that you have in place that is actually working very well, where you guys train the referees that are coming behind you and, and, and paying that forward so that there's a, a proper pipeline as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jerome and I obviously are recently retired. So um, there was a massive gap in high performance coaching around the referees. Or, or, and this is a worldwide thing. This wasn't so, you know, like under David Nusifora put me in place and Jerome is looking after top 14. So, and every country has a similar person in place now to, to try and develop the next generation of, of professional referees. So I suppose we're lucky, Jerome and I, we have a bit of experience um, to be able to pass on. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, some of it good, some of it bad sometimes. But um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a generation of referees of the most experienced, the Nigel Owens, is Jerome's, Wayne Barnes, are all coming to the end. And there's a new generation 
of younger referees coming. So it will be a challenge, I think, some good young referees coming uh, right across the world. But um, they're very young. They're starting very young now. I mean, you know, the Lou Pierce's, the Ben, they're only 30 years of age and they're refing 10 years. So quite young, Jerome. Yeah, no, I think we, it's important for us, um, like Johnny and me in my job, to, to, to prepare a new generation for, for the high level. So is the reason why we, we, we try to work, me in France, I, I try to work like, um, we work so many times with uh, World Rugby during so many years. Uh, work about um, feedback very quickly after the game, um, feedback about every red card, yellow card, decision making about penalty. Um, we, we start to, to, to work with, um, to, to work in English, to, to learn English. Um, we have um, a Zoom meeting now uh, every week um, to speak about uh, foul play, consistency, um, to, to work like a team. So, yeah, we try to do a good job. But... Um, does, does a refer do referees, do they need to have played? And do they need to have played at a high level? I don't, I don't think so. Um, it, it certainly, in my own case, it, it, it certainly helps to get you up so far. But I mean, you know, Nigel Owens never played Wayne Barnes. Jerome, you played for Poe for a while, didn't you? Up to under uh, not Poe, <laughs> but uh, I played for Arudi. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think, Keith, it can get you. There is a generation of, of guys coming that are, there were players, I suppose, uh, coming now. But it, it, it does help to get you up to a certain level. Um, you have a, probably a game understanding, but there's there's lots of different aspects of of of, of fitness, of of accuracy, of of game sense, of learning from mistakes. But I think if you can get a balance between maybe both uh, two pathways, and then it like everything, it goes down to performances at the end of the day. You know, it, whether you played or you didn't play, you get up to a certain level, and then your performances on a consistent basis will will make the difference of you making the the next the next the next level you're always in a drive to get you referees aren't you for for the underage game and that is there a decent pipeline coming through or do you need more um well uh, currently in ireland i'll let jerome speak about france um obviously we've got five pros andy brace and and frank murphy um both on the world rugby panel at the moment joy neville george clancy and sean We've a, a new high high performance development panel of four guys, so four talented guys coming on behind, and then the All Ireland League is a, is a pathway system for the best guys. So we we challenge the best guys in the IL to try and get into that high performance development panel. That's their challenge. The opportunities are there. I think the quality of the All Ireland League is improving. Um, so there's a really good quality rugby that they're refereeing week in week out. And just like an academy player, he's trying to jump up into a development contract or a full-time contract. We're trying to replicate that system for, for, for referees going forward. So we're in good shape at the moment. Um, but obviously, we'll be always trying to look for the next guy that, that's coming for sure. Yeah, in France, we, are, um, we have a 3,000 referee in, in France. And uh, we have, so top 14, who is very tough. Um, competition to referee and we have a second division with a really really good division for for the young to understand and uh, to 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 go up so um, i think that the big opportunity in france is we have so many games every weekend so many opportunities for young referee to to develop skills and develop uh, everything to go on the high level so um, I think it's great in France when you are a referee because we have the opportunity to, to go on the high level. So um, we've, with uh, 3,000 referees in France, we, we are in, the good, uh, in a good way. And uh, of course, we have big leaders uh, on, 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 on World Rugby Panel with Romain Poit, Pascal Gerizer, Mathieu Reynal, Alex Ruiz, uh, Pierre Brousset. So, um, the big leader is really good for us because um, it's good when, when you have a leader who can put all the young uh, who want to grow up, so it's, it's good. Yeah, okay. We also have, uh, obviously, Jerome's nice friendship over the years. We were able to 
have a chat and see where can we get some new opportunities in a different country. So we, we exchanged two, two young French referees uh, and we sent Chris Busby from Ireland, one of our high performance. He went and ref two very tough uh, Pro D2 <laughs> games. Uh, very he, tough games. He, gave us the, he gave us the match that the previous match was a derby and it was an all-in 30-man brawl. He gave us the return <laughs> leg of that game. And I, I'm pleased to say Chris Busby did very well. So thanks for that. No, but it was a, a brilliant opportunity for a referee who's doing really well to go to France and, you know, the two French referees came here to Limerick and ref Munster Leinster in A matches. And it was a fantastic opportunity for them, fantastic opportunity for our referees to get a different type of experience and different culture. So we hope, Jerome and I, to, to keep going to yeah. help referees for the future between France and Ireland. It was great. It was great to, to see, um, to watch Chris uh, in France on a big, big game, very difficult game, but he did, uh, he did very well. So no, it was it was really good. And uh, for the young young French referee, he ref um, uh, Leinster Munster or Munster Leinster, yeah, Leinster yeah, Munster. Yeah. And so uh, product, yeah. you can imagine that for French, when you take the plane and go in Ireland, ref uh, Leinster Munster, it's it's really good. So I think we we need to keep going like this between France and Ireland, because we give uh, opportunity for young referee to to grow up. So it's fine. Can I ask you, Johnny, earlier on, it was really interesting to hear you talk about the difference in style of play and how it affects the entry position um, for rooks. And yeah. you, you made the point that now there's not really any difference in the refereeing styles between the Northern and Southern Hemisphere because it all comes directly. Has that changed? Because traditionally we would have grown up and it would have been like, oh, the French referees are going to be different, the English referees are going to be different. That would have been a big part of the preview of Heineken Cup matches, for example. We'll need to get on the right side of this referee he referees in that specific way. Has that kind of gone from the game a bit? Um, I came into the international panel in 2012 and it was something, Jared, that I, I was interested to see, you know, and we had a lot of meetings. We used to meet in Dubai because it was kind of halfway and, you know, you kind of rookie in the room kind of thing, just sitting there listening, kind of an ex-player. I wasn't really sure what, what was going to happen here, but to be fair, um, you know, Joe Judge was the referee and Paddy, Paddy O'Brien before that. The messages are the same, north and south. I think it's more down to the, the weather conditions and the style of rugby um, is, is, is probably the difference. You know, and then it's up to, is it the performance of the referees are not good enough or good enough or, or they're better in the southern hemisphere or they're better in the northern hemisphere at different times of the year. But the messages since, since I've been in there have been pretty clear. Do we, do, we, do we always agree with each other in that room? Definitely not. You know, we have good open debates, whether it's a, a style of this entry, all we can play on here, what I don't think we can play on here. So we, we, we don't always agree with each other, even in the referee month. So you can imagine between players, referees and fans, we're never going to referee. Cause sometimes and, and, and the coach. <laughs> and the coach. Yeah. I, do, I do have to ask you, have you any idea what's happening in scrums? Um, well, it's, it's an area that's... I took a particular interest personally because it's an area that you wouldn't expect to know a lot about because it's it's a very difficult area to referee. But my own opinion is that, you know, Axel got be good to him. I, I came in and he wanted to referee a training to improve discipline across the board. And, I, and referees want to come in to learn more about set piece and get to ref. Because if your scrum doesn't go well as a team, you train and choose that you do some scrums, you do some setups, you do that. Referee is a poor day at scrums on a Saturday. How does he practice until the following Saturday? So getting access to a team now for us, for me, is a huge part of a referee's weekly training if they can get in there because you can get your timing right, you can get to work on certain things. And the scrum coaches want you in as well because if a, if a ref is in there to ref, that scrum coach can really focus on body positions, angles, binds on his players rather than trying to ref it himself. Because I remember Jerry Flannery, when, when, I, when I was away, he used to have to ref and he hated it because he was getting in all around positions to get knocked over at training. So he used to hate when, when the refs weren't around. But it's a bit more difficult in France logistically to do that. Jerome, or is that happening in uh, France? We, we start to do um, uh, during the summer, summer camp that we have many teams who want um, referees during the summer camp. 
I, I think it's really important for the team, but really important for the referees to understand better yeah. the game and better the scrum because, as as you said, Keith, the, the scrum sometimes is really difficult to referee. Um, but I think like the breakdown, like fall play, for the scrum, we, we try to use um, um, some clear observables to, 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 to have a clear decision making. So if we use something very clear in your head, if it's clear for you, I, I don't say that you are 100% right, but um, if you did um, 95, 95%, it's fine. So. Yeah, 95% would be great. You know, it's the, um, it's, it's because you have six, you have six forwards playing in front of you and each one of them is trying to pull the wool over your eyes. You know, it's the ability to, um, uh, like hookers can drop a scrum and it's almost impossible to say that a hooker has dropped a scrum. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's if he just, if he throws his feet back, he drops his shoulders, there's nothing to hold the center of the scrum, it'll often keel in over. That's I almost impossible, it's almost impossible to see. I would actually pay money to actually go out and watch you referee Monster, Leinster and Scrums with the whistle <laughs> in your hand, spoken like an ex-hooker, prop. They're the best scrum referees in the world. There's the whistle, off you go. See, I did, I did it off. Pulling, binding, angles, slipping, slingshotting. Yeah. yeah well, it's, it's funny. I love it. So it's, we it's, do still, this. it's still entertaining, you know. So, uh, yeah, I let them away with an awful lot, I have to say. <laughs> I'd be a slightly liberal ref. But, um, yeah, it is. And people get increasingly frustrated with the, the scrum, not, or the, the, the feed not being put in straight in the scrum. What, what are your thoughts on that? And I know there's a couple of reasons behind it as well. Yeah, well, I suppose, first of all, it, there's so much going on with, with 16 guys doing all different things in a scrum. Sometimes, I'll be honest, you don't even see it because you're focused on a bind, a hinge, an angle, and so next thing, the ball's in. So uh, the other part of it is that, obviously, it's not people, people think that it's exactly in the middle it's not exactly in the middle. It's, it's slightly to the left because if a hooker had to reach his right foot out too far and, and the, the scrum collapse, it becomes quite dangerous. So the scrum has to be slightly left of centre and then put the ball in straight from there so that the hooker can hook the ball in a safe manner because people sometimes forget that our job is to make sure that the players are safe on the field as well. You know, you know we're not trying to send guys off or, or give cards, but we're, we're trying to stop other players getting injured by the actions of other players. So I think that's a very important thing to say that that's a part of our job as well. And I hope that answers your question around that putting in straight, Keith. Yeah. I think the safety aspect is one of the other big things that we're kind of beginning to start to talk about here in, in State of the Union too. And I'd like to know what it was like from your perspective over the last five, eight years when suddenly the tackle height dropped and so many more red cards happened for tackles that previously the crowd would have been like, yeah, what a great tackle. And to be at the centre of that maelstrom must have been a very interesting and difficult enough period, I suspect, for, for the professional referees, Jerome. Yeah, Jerome has more red cards there. He's much more equipped to answer that than me. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was right, right decision. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, I, I think the crowd, the crowd sometimes is they are happy about a big, big tackle. But... You must think about the players. When you receive a big, a big hit on the head, you are not really happy. I think we, we, we need now we need to understand that we cannot touch the head or the neck. It's so important now. Um, so, so I think again about foul play. Um, if we come back in 2015 World Cup or 2019 World Cup, we don't we don't see many many red cards, but all the red cards. Uh, where well, um, was uh, accurate because we need to protect the players. Uh, I remember so many games uh, that I need to put red card. Uh, it's it's a, it's a difficult uh, decision for the referee to put a red card because you know that during 40 minutes or 60 minutes the team must play with um, only 14 players on the field. But it's it's uh, the, the job. The referee need to, to do the job correctly, and when he, he need to, to put the, the red card, it's because everything need everything is about the red card, and uh, 
And we, the referee never forget one thing. We, we need to protect the players. Yeah, and even during the World Cup, Jared, Keith, you know, I, I was over there for six weeks helping some of the Tier 2 countries. So I was with USA, Canada, Namibia, Tonga and Uruguay teams. And a part of my role for World Rugby there was to work with them on the pitch and, and get the information about high tackles, etc. Um, and where they tackled. So a lot of teams were tackling just underneath the ball. The Tongans decided to tackle on the ball, which is all, always high risk because if it slips up, it goes a little bit high. But the Tongans gave away no, no, no penalty or no card in, in, in their four matches during the Rugby World Cup, which was, which, which was amazing to see. But, and the second point is, it's actually amazing. I don't know, in France, Jerome, we, we are showing a lot of uh, games from years gone by yeah. on TV here in Ireland. And, and it's great to see some of the matches. But what really strikes me watching a lot of these games is the amount of headshots that, yeah. are, that, are, that are in these games. Like... It's just how the game has moved on in the right way to protect our players and young players in the future that there would have been so many more red cards. But now we've got that out of the game. Will we have some from time to time? Of course we will. Someone will get the timing wrong, etc. Someone will dip at the wrong moment or whatever and we'll have a collision and we'll have an incident and we have to decide whether it's foul play or no foul play. But uh, it's, it's moving in the right direction. And, 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 only, and only 10 years ago, when we watched some games uh, 10 years ago, we said, yeah. oh, why, why it's not a penalty? Why it's not a yellow card? It was, <laughs> and I think it's, it's a good way. Uh, we're getting close to the end, uh, the end of this, um, gents. And we haven't actually talked about E at all. We've talked about you and rugby. But what are your highlights? What do you look back at and say that was just such a fantastic thing to be a part of and be involved in? Uh, for me, I think, um, um, of course, the uh, uh, final World Cup in, in Japan was just amazing. So, But I, I really, really enjoy um, the Lions in New Zealand. I think it was uh, one month very... Very, very, very not difficult, but it was it was fantastic to be involved in the Lion series. It's difficult for the French to understand the Lions, um, but but when when you are involved in the Lions, it's you 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 feel what is really important for you, Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, um, England, and it's it's for me the Lions was like um, was like. A, World Cup final, the same level. Yeah, and after. It, yeah, I it's... think uh, I suppose for me, like going to the World Cup is always the probably the pinnacle for for a referee. Um, I suppose refing the bronze medal match in 2015 was was a, was a nice. Thing. I know people don't think much of the bronze medal match, but it was you know it's still you know to see the South Africans come third, what it meant to them in front of 50,000. Um, but I think I, I've always. You know, ref and Pro 14 final, Munster Leinster was a really special occasion in the RDS. Uh, but for me, apart, you know, a couple of European finals. But the Six Nations was always, as a child, I always loved the Six Nations. And to referee that five years in a row, I'm sure that you, you, the Six Nations, Jerome, is a wonderful competition that every, every year it's special. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, and I think yeah because in six six nation you feel you feel the history of the game. Yeah, you you, you really understand the, the history that's gone before you, the referees that have gone before you, uh, and just to be you know only fifteen games every year, um, it's it's a hard thing to be able to get on to ref. So to get to re referee in that every year was uh, definitely the highlight for me. Six nation for me, I remember watching. Um, France Island with Keith and uh, and all the French players. Six Nation for me, it's it's. Uh, I think always about when I was younger with all the family. You watch the TV and you yeah. are waiting for the game, waiting for the for the next game. So and when you are referee in Six Nation, when you are on the field, you said, "Wow, it's it's great." Yeah, Jerome, can you tell us about your preparation for the World Cup final and how you don't become consumed by the occasion? Because obviously. It's such a big match for the two teams involved and you're going to be at the centre of it. You're trying to be as inconspicuous as you possibly can while at the same time making sure that the teams are fully aware that you're in control. So how do you manage not to get 
not to treat it differently from any other game. I said that um, um, when I received the appointment for the final, I was happy for 10 seconds. <laughs> and after you realize that now <laughs> we need to do the job correctly because all the world are waiting for the game and all the world are waiting just for everything and, and um, only one mistake we, we can follow you during many years. So um, it was fantastic during 10 seconds and after a very difficult week because, not difficult, but uh, I decided during the week to work very hard to prepare the game. I said during all the week, just prepare the game, have a clear feedback um, on uh, Thursday with my assistant referee, with my TMO, but I tried to anticipate everything to be very, um, very focused and ready for the game. Um, but I really enjoyed in the end of the game when the game was finished. Uh, my what my my family was here and uh, it was so so fantastic to to be involved. But oh. but but when you arrive in the in the tunnel, when you leave the the, the, the tunnel and we when you see the World Cup um, just in front of you. You realize that um, it will be a, a big uh, 80 minutes. And the big drums really helping the, everybody you know, get even more tense, especially yeah, the, in Japan. The dry, ice, the dry ice smoke that you trip over yourself when you're going <laughs> up because you can't see in front of you. Johnny, do you like the games? Do you enjoy being in the middle of the games? Or is it only afterwards that you have a sense of, oh, okay, that was good? Like, is it in the moment, is it an enjoyable thing to be a referee? I didn't like the days coming up. You know, listen to Jerome there, it just triggers back, you know, Six Nations or finals or whatever. It's like, I think family and friends just know Wednesday comes, just stay away from you because you're just literally go into that that place. That And funny enough, I think you're probably the same, Jerome. It's It's... It's it's not enjoyable, but when you blow the whistle to start the match, then then things seem to lift off your shoulder. And you just get on with it, and you know if you blow the final whistle, assuming that there's no major incidents, and it's it's more like a relief, and mm. that you didn't make a you know a catastrophic mistake during the game, and probably the enjoyment comes later on. You go into the dressing room. Lots of people, and even in a referee's dress room, you've got 10 or 12 people all around her with technicians for all types of stuff and fours and fives and assessors. And you, you get a sense in the post-match that everyone went okay, coaches are talking to you. And then that sense of, you know, in, enjoyment comes and maybe go and have a beer then. And, you know, but that's, that's, that's no different for any of the players. I think referees go through the same type of emotions. I don't, I don't know for a player, but when, when for the referee, when you blow the whistle to start the game, you forget everything. And you are alone with the players, and, uh, and you forget everything. You forget the crowd, you forget uh, the, the, the importance of the game, you forget, and you are just alone with players. And sometimes, I remember, um, you start, maybe it was in Ireland, you start the game with the sun, and uh, we receive the rain, and but you forget everything. <laughs> so I think it's maybe like like the, the the players. I don't know if the player for the same, but the ref it's unbelievable. One last thing for me: what about the relationship with the coaches? When do you actually speak to coaches? Do they do they try and talk to you in the week of games? Do they often come in after matches to to check on what happened there, or what's that like? Uh, well, they go through the relevant referee. So in a test match, for example, uh, if there's any video clips they want to, they send through the world referee manager. Uh, and then they have the opportunity in a test match to meet you the day before. So, is there notes with the, with the video? Is, is it like, here, listen, look at, look at, the, yeah. look at Keith Wood taking his legs back there and, and dropping yeah. that. You look, look, at Keith Wood, this. look at Keith Wood dropping that scrum again as, as a hooker, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's probably voiceover now. They they put the, the coaches put a voiceover with a lot of it now. Uh, they get an opportunity to discuss those if they want on the Friday. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's it's just basically, you know, a cup of coffee. Is there anything that they want from us? If there's anything that we've picked up that we want them to make sure. So it's a kind of a, a two-way conversation that hopefully will end up in a better result the following day for the match. So post-match... Uh, they can come into the changing rooms afterwards. That's you may have an opportunity upstairs 
if they if they come over to you or you go over to them if you feel like it's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, what did you say, Jerome? That it's hot in France. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel it's hot, you might just wait till after the, uh, later on. But again, if they have problems, they have to put the feedback through the proper channels. And yeah, that's the that's the system as far as we're concerned. Yeah, and the, the system is different during the World Cup. During the World Cup, we, 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 don't, we don't receive any feedback from the coach. Um, all the feedback, um, um, all the feedback, the referee, the referee manager receive all the feedback uh, from the coach. And before the game, we don't uh, receive any, any feedback or we, we don't have a meeting with the coach. Is it better to have the meeting or not have the meeting, Jerome? Which, which system do you prefer? I think it, it it was great to see the, the coach on, on Friday uh, before a Six Nation game or rugby championship. Uh, for me, it doesn't doesn't matter. I think we, we just speak about rugby and um, we sometimes we, we can anticipate something, so it's it's great. But uh, I think during the World Cup, uh, during a long um, a long period, I think it's better to still focus. With only the referees, and uh, uh, because we are like a team, so we need to stay uh, focused about on, only one goal, uh, the team of referees. Yeah, I think during like, during World Cups, because the logistics of referees and coaches being in so far away, it, it, it's not really possible. But I always personally enjoyed meeting meeting the coaches for for two reasons. If 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 I wanted to get something across myself that I didn't want to happen, they they would prefer to hear us the day before rather than just blow them off the park or whatever for that particular. And the other, the other part of it is the coach might, might part some tactics about how they're going to play the game mm. the following day. So they're going to kick more. They're going to run more. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. We're going to scrum for penalties. We're going to do that. And it's just an extra piece of information that you can share with your team to get, to get you even more prepared. So you might've prepared your tactics in terms of what way the game might go. But if you if you meet both coaches and they both tell you what they're going to do, that's a conversation that you'll have with your team to maybe give you that extra couple of percent in terms of your awareness of what's going to happen the following day, and you can just be be ahead of it. So that I always find it quite helpful. Right, that is fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Like you know, and the the sense that the coaches obviously they're all trying to somehow gain an influence, but at the same time hoping that you might slip something out about what the opposition are doing. And it's like, it's a, it's a high wire act for all the coaches. You'd never, you'd never share what a coach said, what he was going to do to the other team. That would be... I hope not. No, 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 you wouldn't. You, you, you'd, never, you'd never do that. We used to keep that for our, ourselves. <laughs> give, give ourselves. Give ourselves a head start. Not you won't believe what your man's after telling me what they're going to do to you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Keith, it's been great. And I, I actually think that... Um, it was a good point earlier that the more these conversations happen, the more people understand exactly what's happening because we've, we've had the conversation a lot about how complicated the game is and how any way to demystify that and to explain what the referees are thinking just broadens the church of knowledge out there. I do. I, I, I think the conversation has been fa fascinating. It also shows that there's a human side to the referees, which, of course, the fans never really care about but also the level of focus and preparation that's going on is, is akin to what the professional players are doing. So it is, it's been a brilliant insight, um, gents, and unfortunately we're going to have to get you back on again because we, we can go very specific on something else, but uh, I know that... We, we, are, we are retired now, so we can be more honest. Per perfect. <laughs> I like that. I like if, that. A lot. Honesty works, you know. If you speak in French, Keith, uh, I can come back. No problem. I'll, I'll have it organised very, very soon. Yeah, I, have, you, I, I have my little tapes. I'm trying to do it at the moment, you know. If, if you ever feel like a nice uh, holiday in the south of France, uh, Jerome's house in Po in the Pyrenees, just where the Tour de France goes past, lads. He's always inviting everybody from Ireland down there, so get that out to the listeners. You could go to Po and watch the Tour de France. No, Johnny, Johnny you are wrong. I invite uh, Josh Clancy. But, but but I never see him on, on, in France. So, but I imagine him because I like it. I know that he like um, Tour de France, George. Well, we love France. We love France. Yeah, we do. We do indeed. Uh, C'est magnifique. Jerome, merci. Johnny, thanks a million. This has been another okay. episode so of the State of the Union with Keith Wood. Keith, that was a great one. Um, I, I think we've enjoyed this one a lot. 
Yeah, an awful lot. Um, we're going to have to get you back on again, definitely. But um, the reaction that we're going to get is going to give us a, a ton of different questions that we'll ask you. So we might have to do something very specifically. Yeah. But it is great. It's been great getting a different insight. So, gents, thanks an absolute million. Thank you. Thanks for having us, lads. It's, it's a great platform for us to try and promote it as well a little bit, given Jerome and I's roles as well going forward. So, yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks to invite the French. Oh, anytime, we'll, anytime. We'll, we'll certainly French. have you back. Right, no, that is this week's I, edition I, of... I am De, De Lacy from Normandy. Remember my art. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, always thinking of France, bringing you everywhere. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I said that if I can understand Johnny from Tipperary... Yes. I can understand all the Irish. <laughs> it's true. Hey, right, lads, good stuff. Thanks, Thank brilliant. Thanks, Key. Bye bye. Cheers, gents. OTB Sports Radio.